Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmidt, and today we have two very, very, very special guests. We are talking about metaethics today and moral realism, moral error theory, methodology in metaethics, and everything in between. So my guests are Dr. Russ Schaefer Landau. He is a very big name in the metaethics world. Uh, he's done work on basically everything related to uh, moral realism, metaethics, he's edited collections. I think what the foundations of ethics, uh, that's that's one that we had read in one of my grad seminar classes with Pat Kane. Um, so I really enjoyed that one. Uh, and anyway, he's he's big in the, the world of metaethics and philosophy. Uh, and then Kane B is also big on the YouTube philosophy sphere. He's got his uh, YouTube channel called Kane B. I've linked that in the description. And uh, Kane is also pursuing his PhD in philosophy science. And in particular, he's writing his dissertation on perspectivism. So I saw Submitted it. Oh, you submitted, submitted it. it. Yes, yeah. let's go. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. Happy yes, happy days. Yeah. Uh, when are you defending? I'm curious. Uh, it hasn't. The, the date has not been set yet, but presumably okay. a couple of months, maybe. Okay. Maybe soon. <laughs> okay. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That's great. But he also has a special interest in metaethics, as you could see by his channel. So anyway, I'm delighted to have both you guys on. Thank you for coming on. And uh, I guess I'll just start by laying out the land of, hey, what is uh, metaethics? What is moral realism and so on? So in metaethics, we're basically just investigating the nature of um, moral reality, the nature of the moral domain. Like um, what is goodness? What is badness? What is rightness, wrongness? What are these moral properties? Um, are there moral truths? If there are, what is their nature? Are they stands independent? Things like that. It's at a pretty high level of abstraction compared to what philosophers call normative ethics, which is um, like what makes right actions right, what makes wrong actions wrong, things like that. Uh, and then you also have applied ethics, which is just like, is abortion right or wrong? Or like the more kind of tangible, concrete cases. So anyway, within metaethics, there is um, there are a lot of different debates, but one debate concerns whether or not moral realism is true. So I kind of like to have a little branching structure as I think about the dialectical context here. And we basically just ask a series of questions. So the first question we ask is, um, relative to some domain of discourse, we don't really need to talk about uh, how folk people use the terms, because I know Lance Bush, uh, Ken, Ken, you're aware of this, but Lance Bush has done stuff about like indeterminacy and, uh, and lots of other stuff with respect to uh, the empirical side of things. But relative to some domain of discourse, like our current one, uh, we can ask, are moral claims or moral judgments are they truth act? Do they express propositions? And you can either say yes or no. If you say no, well, then you've got non-cognitivism. And if you say yes, you've got cognitivism. And then you can ask, um, are some of them true, right? Uh, are some of such moral claims or judgments true? If you say no, well, then you've got error theory. They're all false, uniformly false. And if you say yes, um, well, then you have a further question. Then you ask, uh, well, okay, some of them are true and they're truth apt. Um, are their truth values independent of people's stances, like their beliefs and desires and attitudes and so on? Uh, and you can either say yes or no. If you say no, you're a subjectivist. Uh, you could go different routes. You could go individualist subjectivism or societal or whatever. Um, but if you say yes, you are a moral realist. So there are stance independent moral truths. Uh, and of course you got naturalist and non-naturalist moral realism in there. But um, anyway, I'll just, uh, uh, I'll turn it over to you guys, Russ first, if you have any comments on that or if you wanna explicate things further. Um, and yeah, so I'll just open it up. Yeah, so Joe, thanks for that uh, intro. I think what you've done is you've sketched uh, what you might call a minimalist conception of moral realism. I actually like a more maximalist version that uh, that uh, incorporates a couple further claims. One is an epistemological one that's an anti-skeptical claim. Namely, we can grasp some that we do, in fact, grasp some of these truths. Uh, we can and we do. So that's a kind of success, epistemic success condition. And another is a kind of normative authority uh, that I favor, but not everyone who uh, calls themselves a realist uh, would favor. And that's the idea that morality some, in some fashion or other has some kind of uh, authority over us, such that Typically, when uh, the dictates of morality clash with those of self-interest or what we most want, morality wins out. That's a metaphor, of course, but uh, for me and for some other moral realists, at least, a kind of moral realism worth defending requires that kind of authority claim. If it were the case that you could easily shirk your moral duties or uh, your moral reasons were completely insignificant relative to your instrumental, your prudential reasons, then, you know, let's just talk about something else, not interesting anymore. That's so my two cents. Yeah. And Kane, if you have any explications or comments. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I think I, I pretty much uh, 
agree with uh, yeah with with what you what you said in the introduction and i mean maybe uh, you know i always um whenever i'm sort of introducing this to people um i always kind of like to clarify you know when we sort of say that you know moral realism involves supposing that there are stance independent or some people sometimes say like mind independent moral truths or moral facts um you know like I, I do sometimes find that when when people are new to it they they sort of say well you know how could that possibly be right I mean, obviously if if slavery is wrong it's wrong because of for instance it causes suffering or you know whatever and that's going to be about how people respond to it so i i mean you know when when we so i suppose just one point of clarification would be like when we say that uh these are supposed to be stance independent or mind independent uh, the way to think of it is is maybe in terms of like the moral moral truths are discovered rather than invented. So yes, of course, uh, you know, slavery is wrong is going to depend on how it affects people. Um, but uh, the fact that it's wrong is something that we like. Yeah, we we find out. We even it, maybe one way to put it is even if everybody believed that slavery was acceptable, and even if everybody accepted values which entailed the acceptability of slavery, um, it would still be wrong, or something along those lines. Yeah, that's good, that's good. One final piece of clarification before we start talking about like methodology and metaethics a little bit. Um, I guess we should probably get on the audience's radar the distinction between natural and non-natural moral realist views. So at least as I understand it, and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Russ, for the, the main explication, but um, the, the naturalist moral realist says roughly that um, moral properties are kind of uh, scientifically discoverable, they are uh, amenable to scientific investigation or some sort of empirical investigation, um, whereas non-naturalists deny that. Um, but that's just my rough and ready uh, understanding. So I'll turn it over to you, Russ, to kind of clarify that. Well, that is the that's the going rough and ready characterization. There is no agreed on uh, character definition or characterization of the distinction between the natural and the non-natural. The one that you picked up on is the one that hails from G.E. Moore, who first introduced this distinction in 1903 in his book, Principia Ethica. And that's a pretty good rough and ready characterization. The, uh, I'm working with a couple of other philosophers and have been for many years now. Uh, John Bankson, my former colleague at UW, is now at UT Austin, and Terence Cuneo, who teaches at Vermont. And we're working on this manuscript called The Moral Union universe. And we're pretty far along. And uh, it's a defense of non-naturalist moral realism. So it's incumbent on us to actually have some ideally sharp characterization uh, of it. And we don't actually like the one that you, uh, that you introduced, although that is, as, that is, as you say, the going conception. Uh, we rather think of the distinction in this way, that what it is to be a non-natural property is to have a certain kind of essence or nature. What it is to be this property is specifically such that you can't accurately characterize its, its essence or its nature without adverting to normative properties, at least one normative property. Um, now, that raises the question, of course, what's a normative property? And we can get into that later if you want. But right now, if you just have a sort of basic intuitive grasp of what it is to be a normative property, our view is that a non-natural property is one whose essence ineliminably involves a normative property. And so what that does is it respects the paradigms, among other things. So, you know, paradigm natural property is being two feet long or being square or, or um, being a quark, being charged. Uh, if you take, if you drill in and say, what's the nature, the essence of those features, those properties, you won't find anything normative therein. At least, so I suppose, so I'm surmising. Yeah. Yeah, so um, just for the audience, because uh, not everyone in my audience will be familiar with um, what um, normative is, but are you conceiving of that as involving some kind of um, external reasons giving or, or, no. or is it oughtness, just like what you ought to do, ought not to do? Or it's, you... uh, it's the way we think of it is pretty simple. Just think of it extensionally as something involving um, a, a favoring relation, an, a value relation, a directive, like you ought, you must, mm -hmm. you should do something, uh, a fittingness relation or a virtue relation. Okay. That's what it is. To, just, to be normative is to be one of those, possess one of the, or bear one of those, um, actually to be one of those relations. Now let's get on to um, methodology and metaethics. So as I understand it, uh, Russ, you and um, 
Cuneo and Banks in, I think it's a three, three book series as it were. And I think the first one is um, methodology and metaethics. Is that correct? It, we are writing three books together um, and one, the first book, it's not really a series, it's a standalone book, okay. just came out. It's in, it's called Philosophical Methodology from Data to Theory. And I just got my advanced copy last week. Uh, it's not a book in metaethics. It's okay. a book that's meant to be, it's meant to be applicable to all philosophical inquiry. All right. So yeah. how, how about we uh, now just uh, like how you would apply that to metaethics. So let's move into that kind of section of the video. Sure. So how, how, how do you go about methodology in metaethics? So comparing the theories of realism, anti-realism, and so on, because that's going to be relevant to later on when we're talking about why, for instance, you accept uh, realism and why, for instance, Kane doesn't. So yeah. So one of the things we do in this book is we uh, develop a new method for doing philosophy. Uh, it's not a re it doesn't herald a revolution. It's, it incorporates many familiar elements from ordinary uh, philosophizing. Um, but what it does is it identifies three distinct levels of philosophical inquiry. And the, the first one is directed to data. We need a theory of what philosophical data are. We have such a theory, but I'm not going to I'm not going to take time unless you want me to to spell out that theory. But whatever the data are, and I'll just give you it in a nutshell for us, that the data are those claims that uh, inquirers consider collectively have good reason to believe at roughly at the outset of inquiry. Um, they're meant to be neutral among theories, non-factive. They're not, so data aren't facts necessarily. They're not things that we happen to believe. They're not appearances. They're not the way things seem to be to us. They're not, the, they're not a function of how we use language. They're rather the sorts of claims that we have good reason to believe. We collectively, we inquire collectively. And the first, at the first level of this method that we've developed, what uh, inquirers do is they direct their attention to the data. All the data need to be handled, and they're handled in one of three ways. Uh, well, you got to either in, invoke claims in building a theory that's meant to handle this data. You invoke claims that accommodate them, that is, are such that the data are likely given your theory, your theoretical claims, and those your theory helps explain these data. Now, you don't have to accept every datum because the data are non are non-factive. So that, that doesn't mean that they're all false. It just means that it's not the case that just by virtue of being a datum, it, it's a fact, okay? Um, now, if a theorist says, you know what? This datum, not, not keen on this datum, as an error theory will likely be with regard to many of the data, uh, many, many of the meta-ethical data. It's incumbent on a theorist in that case to offer an adequate defense of the claim that their theory need not either accommodate or explain a given datum. When you do that, you're beginning to build the theory up with attention to the data. But every claim you enlist in that theory building enterprise itself needs to be defended as you've got to identify some positive reason, some positive argument on behalf of that theory, uh, sorry, on behalf of that claim. And you also have to explain it that enterprise of defending and explaining we call substantiation. You also have to integrate every claim that you make in that process, where integration is a matter of displaying internal and external coherence. The external coherence involves coherence with common sense, our best conception of the world, including what science tells us is, is the case. And at that point, and only at that point, do you attend to the virtues of your theory and ask whether or not your theory taken as a whole is more theoretically virtuous than any competitor. It's an upshot of our preferred methodology that attention to theoretical virtues plays a very insignificant role in theory construction and theory evaluation. The attention to theoretical virtues like simplicity, for instance, comes in only at what we call that third level, where at the first level you attend to the data, you build a theory that accommodates and explains the data. At the second level, you substantiate the claims made at the first level and any further claims made at the second level, and you integrate 
everything. And that's a huge undertaking by itself. The manuscript that we've got right now for doing that with regard to the metaphysical and normative elements of morality runs to about 350 pages. Now we've got the third book that we're doing together, which is all about the epistemology and, and, the pra and moral psych psychological elements in metaethics. Also trying to defend a non-naturalist non realist take on that. So it's likely for us that this enterprise is gonna take about 600, 650 pages to fulfill the instructions given by the method that we prefer in order to construct a theory that we think is a plausible view of the nature of morality. So the, that's a long, long answer, I get, but that, that gives you some flavor at least of the methodology we prefer and how it might be applied in the meta-ethical realm. Sounds good. So um, I'm thinking I could probably just start um, opening it up to, uh, well, first, first I'll, I'll let Kane comment on that and whether or not he has a uh, preferred methodology, like for instance, reflective equilibrium or other sorts of things. Uh, but now we could probably open it up after Kane gets his word there um, to talking about some of the data uh, and comparing the, the relevant theories, like let's say realism and error theory or whatever. Um, and for instance, that's when we're potentially gonna get into arguments like the evolutionary debunking argument, whether or not um, uh, moral realism, for instance, especially non-naturalist moral realism can um, adequately accommodate our, for instance, our epistemic access to the moral truths and so on. So uh, for the audience, we're getting into the juicy stuff soon, uh, but uh, anyway, um, Kane, you can uh, add any comments if you like, but I think we should, potentially just now kind of open it up to talking about some of the data and some of the, um, the evidence on offer as it were. Okay, yeah, I, well, you, you asked me, you, you said, you know, if, if I had a preferred methodology and um, honestly, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I, I don't think that I, that I do. <laughs> so I tend to be quite, um, I, uh, you know, quite sort of pluralist about this stuff, uh, uh, you, you, you know, but I, yeah, I think, I think you know, like I say, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure what my own approach is. Maybe I should know, but, uh, you know. <laughs> hey, I, I didn't start really thinking about this stuff right. until, until I was in my fifties. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so you, like got, when you got plenty to, of time, <laughs> you know, the, the sort of meta philosophy, philosophical methodology. I'm really, I'm really not sure. Uh, so, yeah. All right. So let's start talking about some of the data. So, um, if, uh, if someone on the airplane was asking you, Russ, uh, hey, what, what's some of this data that could possibly support non naturalist moral realism? Um, like, what are you going to say to them? I'm going to say two things, uh, three things. First is, do you really want to hear what I'm about to say? <laughs> <laughs> and then on the assumption that, they, yeah, I do. I say, okay, two things. One is, the way you put the question, Joe, is totally natural, but it is a way I'd resist. That, and that is that, I don't think that the data favor one theory over another, or don't have to. Mm -hmm. Some data are naturally more congenial to other data, like take a datum in aesthetics, for instance, where our aesthetic judgments tend to track very closely our personal preferences. That's a datum. If you've got a subjectivist theory about uh, the aesthetic realm, then, or the aesthetic domain, then uh, that, that theory is gonna very easily handle that datum. If instead you've got a realist theory about aesthetics, it's gonna be harder, right? So I, I, I accept that there is a sense in which the data favor, but really the data are meant to be pre-theoretical and not gerrymandered or cherry-picked. One thing I think is, that often happens in meta-ethical debates is that folks like realists tend, tend to pick uh, a handful of data that are especially congenial to their view uh, and then downplay some of the others. But that's what happens on the other side too. You know, expressivists in metaethics will focus on certain, uh, on, on the datum uh, that says, for instance, that moral judgments have marks of practical attitudes. So they direct people, they guide them, they motivate them. Uh, and that's a datum. I think it's very easy for expressivists to handle that datum. It's harder for realists to do so. So um, with that caveat, I'd say, here's, here's some of the data. Uh, one is a correlation datum, how things are morally is uh, correlated with the way things are non-morally. 
There's a datum about, say, inescapability. Some moral demands and reasons are inescapable with respect to normative assessment. Um, there's a non-contingency datum, I think. It's not deeply contingent that some things have the moral features they do. I think there's a grant, there's a datum about epistemic access that moral agents do sometimes grasp, or at least are well positioned to grasp moral reality. Um, there is a disagreement datum. There's widespread moral disagreement, uh, some of which may be irresolvable, unresolvable. Um, there's also an agreement datum, I think, that there's widespread agreement uh, in morality about many things. Um, that's a small sampling of things that I think are data. And of course, if you focus on some of them, like the disagreement datum, that's gonna be, you know, just like Keynes gonna say, yeah, I'm gonna lap that up. Erethius, you know, that's putty in their hands. And that's, uh, that's harder for a realist to account for. On the other hand, there's a datum about epistemic access, I think it is, the case that inquirers at the outset of inquiry, at least, have good reason to believe, uh, have good reason to believe that we sometimes have moral knowledge, for instance, that uh, genocide is immoral. And like I said, the data are non-factive. So if you're an error theorist, you're going to have to explain those data away and uh, give a defense of why it is that your theory doesn't, in fact, have to make that datum likely or explain it. Uh, and erythiers have a lot of ways of trying to do that. But in any event, that's a handful of the data that, that I think uh, that are in metaethics. Sweet. So, Ken, I'll just open up to you guys. You guys can go back and forth. Um, maybe you, you could talk about disagreement or whatever. It's up to you. Um, OK. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, maybe, uh, so maybe, maybe one thing I could ask then is like these data, for instance, data about epistemic access. Um, why why would I accept that that's that that is a datum? I mean, so in in the case of something like you know disagreement or agreement for that matter, it looks like we can just describe the patterns of variations in people's moral judgments, um, like in a in a way that everybody's going to initially agree with. But if you know I have initially anti-realist inclinations um then you know like i just i'm not going to accept the datum that people have you know epistemic access to moral facts or anything along those lines right mm -hmm. yeah you're not going to accept that but i think you that shouldn't bar you from accepting it as a datum so i accept as a datum that there is widespread disagreement in the moral realm i accept as a datum that there's a very reliable connection between sincere moral judgment and action or mo motivation better. Right. Um, and these data seem naturally uh, suit easily explained and accounted for by an anti-realist judgment uh, theory. And I think they're data nonetheless. Why? Because I think that inquirers considered collectively before they bring all their theoretical baggage in, I mean, you, you, you prefaced your comment by saying, suppose I've got, you know, an anti, starting with an anti-realist theory, but the data are not meant to be uh, collected by reference to, or through a particular theoretical lens. They're meant to be, uh, they're meant to qualify as data by virtue of being the thing, the sort of things that inquirers considered collectively have good reason to believe. And I think that when we take a look at our moral practices, our, our moral thinking, our moral discourse, uh, inquirers considered collectively, not, that is not every single inquirer, of course, some like you may already have strong theoretical bases for their beliefs, but co considered collectively, I think these things do qualify as things for which pre-theoretically we have strong reason to believe them. Now that reason is defeasible. And so it, it is the case that, you know, it might turn out that after all, there isn't a good uh, you know, the practicality datum, the, as I've called it, doesn't actually call out for being explained and accommodated by a theory. Maybe, you know, some realists might say, you know what, in the end, uh, moral judgments don't bear this kind of practical connection to motivation and action. But it's incumbent then on that sort of realist, not me, by the way, but uh, that sort of realist to try to 
debunk the, the datum, either by saying it's no datum at all, or although it is, it's not incumbent on my theory to accommodate and explain it, but then it is incumbent on that theorist to offer an adequate defense that they don't need to do that sort of work. Yeah, so I, I guess um, maybe I should ask like, well, what, what exactly does it, does it mean to accept a datum? Um, because it seems like if I, if I were to accept the data that, you know, say the epistemic access data, then, then that looks like I'm going to be committed to at least a sort of minimal realism Mm, yeah, I was in virtue of doing that. I mean, at least maybe I misunderstood um, what that datum is. So it, it's like if the datum is phrased in something as along these lines, where we might say, well, you know, like a lot of people take themselves to have <laughs> access to the, you know, to the moral facts. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously everybody can agree with that, right? Um, yeah. So may, have I like, did I misunderstand that? Or yeah, that's that's not the datum. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. Who? Yeah. So that's a that's a date that may be a datum in sociology. It's not a datum in me, in meta ethics. The datum I take it is that some people are well positioned and in fact succeed in grasping more, uh, the nature of moral reality. Um, and then what? There's a kind of ambiguity here in accepting the datum. I was talking about the importance of a, of theorists accepting that this is a datum. There is this natural reading of accepting a datum as believing it true. And of course, I don't want to saddle the air theorists to the anti-realist or some anti-realists with having to accept the datum in that sense. Um, and that wouldn't be a very plausible theory of data, construed as uh, neutral, pre-theoretical, non-factive claims, which is the way we construe philosophical data. So what I was suggesting is that no matter your th theoretical inclinations, you should accept that this is a datum. And then what our methodology, what, what our method does is it says, well, given that this is a datum, here's what you gotta do. You either have to do one of two things. One, accommodate and explain it. That is, develop a theory according to which that datum is likely to be true, given your theory, and explain why that datum is true. That's one possibility. The other is the one that you're likely to take, which is to offer, or try to offer an adequate defense of the claim that that datum needs no accommodation or explanation because, and then give your story, you know, um, that'll be whatever error theoretic story you wanna offer. And that's the sort of thing that I might, uh, as a realist, feel compelled to do about certain of the other data that at least initially seem more congenial to an anti-realist interpretation. As it turns out, all the data that uh, we identify uh, in meta-ethics, there are about 20 of them. There are, a lot, lot, there are a lot more, but these seem to be the core ones. These are ones that we intend our theory to be able to accommodate and explain. We don't utilize what we call an escape clause, which is that second route I just sketched, where you say, you know what? my theory doesn't really need to accommodate and explain, or explain this datum after all. Okay, so um, why should I, in any sense, accept this datum? I mean, because so another thing I, I could say, well, you know, one of the, one of the data is um, that people don't have any access to a moral reality. Um, yeah, well, I, so how do why I would you decide? think that's a data? Why would you think that's a datum? Well, I, I, I don't. Um, but <laughs> I, mean, I don't, why, I don't know why, why I'm anyone? thinking that this other one is a datum. So I'm just saying, like, okay, yeah. there's the there's the opposite claim. Um, and so, well, okay, here's here's one reason why. Um, I mean, I I could just say, look, um, I mean, I, I know that certainly, I, I I was always inclined towards anti-realism uh, for one reason or another. I I don't know why, but certainly, you know, as soon as I started thinking about meta-ethics, uh, that seemed like the right option so clearly you know I, I i i was always inclined that way um so i guess you know you you might you know you could you could run a kind of phenomenal conservatism argument or something like that you know say well that that that's more in line with my intuitions um but i mean my point wasn't to say you know no 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 this is the datum i'm, I'm just trying to clarify uh, when when i'm supposed to accept that 
people have epistemic access to a moral reality. Uh, I, I'm I'm just not sure what attitude I'm or, or, like what that means. Um, so yeah, you know, so I'm, I'm the, just, that's why yeah. I'm introducing this the the opposite, right? So like, <laughs> what's the difference? Like, why why am I accepting this and not this one? Yeah, so there are a lot of different ways to collect data, and that's true for all areas of inquiry, and we, and it's true in all areas of philosophical inquiry too. There are you know there are linguistic tests, there are recourse to intuition, there are surveys of arguments and things like that. There there are a lot of ways to to collect the data, but it seems to me that one. This is not. This is one among many ways, but one way is to take a look at what the practices within the domain that you're investigating look like. And when we take a look at moral practices, and when we, uh, it seems that almost everyone's talking as if there's some moral knowledge. Almost everyone is thinking that there's moral knowledge. They're going on as if there's moral knowledge. Um, this is just with respect to one datum. We can, the, we can call it the epistemic success date. We can call it whatever you want. Um, and so when you just, before you bring to bear your, you know, your heavyweight realist convictions or anti-realist convictions, you just take a look at the domain and its practices and its goings on. And it seems that although there are folks like you who are, rel, you know, comparatively speaking, outliers here in, in having error theoretic views, Certainly, it's not the case that you determine whether something's a datum by counting heads, but you. Can, but in whatever way you say collect data about, philo collect data about philosophy, it's not we think an individualistic one-off enterprise where your data differ from my data set and they and these two might differ from Joe's. the The thought is that there is one data set, um, and as I say, some of these data may be more congenial to a realist theory than others, yet other data may be more congenial to an anti-realist theory. But the realist can't just cherry pick these data and pick the one and pick those data that really work well with their own theory. They've got to handle all the data. And that might mean saying of some data, you know what? Our, it's not incumbent on our theory to have to accommodate and explain these after all. Ditto for, for you. Mm -hmm. um I should just clarify. Actually, I'm I'm uh, I'm not an error theorist. Um, oh, I'm I mean, sorry. I'm happy to I'm, I'm happy sorry to play the role that. of the error theorist if people want. Uh, but uh, no, I, I, I don't want. Uh, no, I, I don't want you to. I, was, <laughs> I don't know um, why I got that in my head. Sorry about that. Um, I, I might sorry. have I might have said something like you lean towards or sympathetic towards it or something. But I know I, can you I, have sympathetic is okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I know it's very complicated because like there's the variabilism and in you know indeterminism right. and all that stuff about lance bush and empirical yeah. metaethical psychology but uh apologies um, apologies if i was <laughs> responsible for that uh for that um implant for that uh data no i'm kidding so yeah i think that it it, it seems like then maybe the disagreement here is about um what our practices actually actually look like because i'm not sure i agree that you know that everybody uh, talks as if they were realists. Um, I no, they don't. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, they don't. Okay. No, I mean, the, many people talk, especially in our ethics one hundred and one classes, talk as if they were relativists, right? Right. But yeah. If, yeah. But if you take so, it's not that the data you know invariably favor realism. I they don't. Um, but it is the case that if you take a look at moral practice, I think that inquirers considered collectively do have good reason to think that we sometimes get it right. Now that could be, you know, that reason, as I say, could be defeasible. It could, it could turn out that we never get it right because there's nothing, there's nothing to, there's no truth available or we're just, the truth is ineffable, you know, whatever it happens to be. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's, um, it seems to me plausible, let's put it this way, that this is a good starting point. Uh, it's not factive, but it's a good starting point. It may not be a good ending point, you know, if you've got anti-realist inclinations and can build up a theory uh, designed to handle the data that can adequately handle the data in one of the two ways I, I mentioned, and then also substantiate and integrate its claims 
may be that in the end, you know, the realist loses. But that's after a lot, a lot of work. Yeah, on both the I, realist part and the anti-realist part. I'm still, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I, I feel like this is, I, I don't want to get to the point where this is like, you know, a kid just asking why, why, why. But like, I'm just not sure. I, okay. I, I mean, it, it doesn't seem, so it doesn't seem to me like, people have good reason to think that they're accessing moral reality. That never seemed to be the case to me. And I, I don't, I certainly wouldn't say that like, that's what the, you know, the practice looks like when I, you know, think about, okay, the practice of people making moral judgments, at least on an everyday basis. Maybe if, if I was to sort of restrict it to something like, I don't know, f philosophers working in normative ethics or something, maybe it would, it would look a bit different then. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm still not sure like why, why I should accept this data. Hmm. Well, let me, let me try out a different one. What about uh, what I call the correlation? You could call it the supervenience data. The way things are morally is correlated with the way things are non-morally. The datum itself is very open-ended. It doesn't mention supervenience itself, much less, you know, global or weak or strong supervenience as, and that's right. I think it, data are general and in want of persistification. Um, does that seem like a datum to you? I don't think so. I think to me, the datum would seem <laughs> something more like, you know, uh, if, if, you, if, if that's offered as a description of people's moral views, um, then that seems completely neutral um, and that would seem correct. Uh, so yeah, like um, people's moral views seem to be such that they take it that the way things are morally, I mean, I'd even be happy to say supervenes on the way things are non-morally. Um, but if you remove that qualification, uh, then no, I'm, I'm not sure why I should accept that. Well, one thing we could do yeah. uh, is I, I actually suspect that this might um, be undergirded by methodological differences. So I, I suspect that, um, which, which means we could potentially just um, uh, set that aside and just move on to certain particular arguments that we find interesting and how um, a, a, a non-natural moral realist, for instance, might respond and how Kate and you guys might go back and forth on that. So maybe we could just do that next because, um, uh, yeah, anyway, I think I think this is probably going to bottom out in methodological differences. But um, yeah, let, let's move on to a specific argument. So I know, uh, Kane, you recently did an evolutionary debunking argument video, and I, I, I enjoyed the video, and um, I've always been fascinated by these sorts of arguments, partly because they also overlap with philosophy of religion. Um, you know, you have like the evolutionary debunking argument against naturalism. So um, I guess I'll just turn over to you, Kane, to articulate just the basic thrust of the argument, um, the evolutionary debunking argument, and then um, let's just go back and forth on that. So um, whether or not it uh, challenges a kind of, um, well, realism simpliciter, but perhaps also non-naturalist realism, because uh, we have a non-naturalist realist in our midst, of course. So Okay, yeah. I, I should add, by the way, I mean, I'm, I'm very, un like, much unconvinced by the evolutionary debunking argument. So, um, you know, yeah, uh, again, you know, it's not like my argument. I just did an introductory uh, of video course, on of it, course. you know. Um, so I think that the, uh, the, so the evolutionary debunking argument is one example of um, what's known as genealogical debunking. And what you do in a genealogical debunking argument is you uh, tell a story about the origin of some belief or some set of beliefs. Um, and then uh, that's going to try to show that, um, those beliefs uh, are not truth tracking. So, you know, those beliefs are not like tracking the facts. Um, so in, on a, in a very like, a very abstract way of putting it, genealogical debunking arguments have a causal premise, which says, you know, somebody's belief that P or some set of beliefs uh, is explained by some process. And then there's an epistemic premise that those processes are off track. So the belief or set of beliefs are unjustified. And example of this would be something like, you know, imagine if I uh, read a book about some uh, society in the Amazon, maybe, and I, I read about some set of rituals or whatever that they do. And I form a belief that, you know, maybe once a year they do some sort of special ritual, right? Um, but then I discover that actually, uh, the person who wrote this book just made up a whole bunch of it, right? Like they've admitted that a lot of it was fabricated. So 
I mean, it, it looks like that's going to undermine the justification for my belief. Um, you know, the, it, it seems that uh, it's, it's like, OK, I, I have this belief about this tribe, um, which was taken from this book, but this person just made up a lot of it. So um, looks like I should probably sus at least suspend judgment and maybe just give up the belief entirely. Right. So um, the evolutionary debunking argument does the same kind of thing um, with, uh, with our moral beliefs. Uh, and so what it will say is that our moral beliefs are in some sense explained by our evolutionary history, right? Evolutionary history explains uh, the moral beliefs that we have. Maybe like it, it's not going to explain, you know, the precise content of our moral beliefs. So if I believe something like, I don't know, like maybe I'm a utilitarian, right? Uh, evolutionary history probably isn't going to explain that, um, but it's going to explain the sort of uh, basic evaluative attitudes um, that I might use in forming my moral beliefs, you know, so it's going to explain something about uh, the way that my moral intuitions arise or, or something like that. Um, and then you say, well, evolution isn't truth tracking with respect to the moral facts. So it seems like we would have the same basic evaluative attitudes that we have, regardless of what the moral facts are, because you know, why do people have the evaluative attitudes they have? Well, it's, be, it's, it's going to be because they have whatever evaluative attitudes happen to promote survival and reproduction. Um, so, like, why do we have the attitude that, say, survival is good? Well, you know, if somebody didn't have that attitude, if somebody didn't care about survival or they thought survival was bad, um, that would probably interfere with their ability to survive and reproduce, right? So, um, and, then, and similarly, you know, you can say, well, humans are, are a social species right there's a, there's a certain way that humans lived in the past um and that's going to result in them having particular evaluative attitudes regardless of what the moral facts are so maybe one way to think about it is to like imagine if you know lions were to develop the ability to you know reason and develop moral theories uh well what sort of attitudes would lions have um it seems like based on the kind of lives that lions live, based on the kind of species they are, they might have the attitude that, you know, it's perfectly okay for a male to uh, kill unrelated offspring. And then when a male does that, females would become more attracted to him rather than think that he's a monster, right? So, um, so yeah, that, that's, the, that's the basic idea. I think that hopefully sums it up. <laughs> this, uh, does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Joe, do you want me to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, guess, I guess, yeah, I just, yeah, just going to okay. give like some examples, yeah. you know, so um, like had we, you know, like uh, had we, for instance, grown up in, you know, you have these various counterfactual conditionals that try to show that um, our um, basic evaluative tendencies or perhaps our moral faculties or however we want to describe it um, are not appropriately sensitive to or are not appropriately tracking moral reality or the moral domain so that we don't appropriately, uh, or we aren't legitimately having uh, knowledge in this, in, in such cases, right? So if we take the case of um, termites, right? They like, they're eusocial insects and they, they do some really weird things. So they like, I think they, uh, what, they like cannibalize their dead and like some some other eusocial insects like kill their uh, <laughs> brothers or sisters or whatever. They like, they kill a lot of them. And, you know, had we evolved in that kind of way, we likewise would have presumably thought that, oh yeah, this is a really good thing that we are uh, killing our brothers and sisters and so on, because like that's conducive to our survival and reproduction. And so um, basically like, had we evolved in these slightly different ways than we actually did, uh, we would have had very different and conflicting moral beliefs than what we do in fact have. And so that that is supposed or alleged to show that um, our beliefs are not uh, sensitive to the truth in a manner that could undergird our having moral knowledge. So I just wanted to give some concrete examples from the eusocial insects. Um, but but yeah, I'll turn it over to you. Um, and you, both of you guys can go back and forth on this for a little bit, um, the, the evolution debunking argument. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not persuaded by the arguments, surprise, surprise. Uh, I don't think that these debunkers have done nearly enough to make out the empirical claim, first of all. Many of the, the best of these uh, debunking stories 
involve just so stories that are highly speculative about the causal influence of various uh, natural selective pressures on the evaluative attitudes that we have. That's the first thing. And really to, to make, uh, Joe Kane, sorry, you did a really nice job laying out, you know, the, uh, the, the basics of an evolutionary debunking argument. And there, you know, there are, as you say, these two basic premises. There's this empirical premise that cites a certain kind of causal genealogy uh, with our evaluative attitudes at the end of that genealogy. And then there's some epistemic pre premise that says, given that causal history, our, there's an underminer for the justification of our moral beliefs. I think if it were the case that we could show that we have our beliefs, our moral beliefs, or judgments or attitudes, however, whatever you want to call them, um, because uh, that is either fully or almost fully. Well, I think actually we need fully because um, we because of various selective pressures. Then I think the justification of our moral judgments, let's call them, would be defeated. You can run the same. You can run the same kind of argument. This is this is an old argument in new clothes, where the old argument was we believe we have the moral. We make the moral judgments we do just because of the culture that we were raised in. Um, now the claim is well, it's not necessarily just because of culture. It's just because of culture and evolution. In some cases, the less careful ones, it's just because of evolution. Uh, I th yeah, I think that if that if that's so, then we've got no reason. We can't have any independent reason for thinking that our our moral attitudes are on track, and so we have to suspend judgment. So that does count as an undercutting defeater of our justification for our moral judgments. But the the case has not been made successfully. I think that the sole explanation for our having the moral attitudes that we do is evolutionary pressures or those plus the culture that we were raised in. For all the science tells us, uh, we have, some of us have some of the moral judgments we do because we are adequately sensitive to the moral truth. Now, of course, if you're an error theorist, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, Kane, that you're an error theorist, but if one is an error theorist, that, that kind of view isn't gonna sound very plausible, but all I wanna say is that kind of view has not been disqualified on the basis of the substance of the arguments made yet on behalf of the evolutionary debunking, the debunkers. Yeah, I, I think I, uh, I pretty much agree. Um, I mean, certainly with, with the first point, uh, yeah, I, it seems to me, and this is one reason why I said earlier, you know, like I'm, I'm not really sure I endorse this argument. Um, well, I mean, I, I don't really. It's, it's precisely this problem. Um, I, I don't, I don't think the uh, empirical claims have been supported uh, well enough. And actually, I mean, I, I suspect that it, it seems implausible to me. Um, I, I mean, again, this is just maybe just sort of general maybe I, I like background views about like evolutionary psychology and so on um it, it seems implausible to me that we're going to be able to explain a lot about our moral practices um by appealing to evolutionary history i mean i think it's probably true that you know our some of our basic evaluative attitudes um obviously have got some sort of you know basis in our genes let's say um but i'm not sure that you can conclude much from that um I mean, you know, it's, it's also like that you get kind of different versions of this argument where it's like, okay, what are we, what exactly are we targeting? Like, are we targeting just the general capacity to make moral judgment? Um, or are we targeting like specific moral norms? Um, and I mean, either, either way, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced, uh, yeah, that the, uh, the, the empirical evidence is strong enough um, to, uh, to, to defeat moral belief. So I guess we share, an attitude, share the same sort of view on, on that point. Um, I mean, you know, maybe one, one thing that we could say is, well, all right, if we're granting that, you know, our basic evaluative attitudes 
arise from, you know, or, or are, are produced by, you know, these selective pressures um, and that these are not tracking truth, um, then maybe that's going to be a problem if we think, you know, of so, so like with certain methodologies, like maybe, uh, you know, a sort of reflective equilibrium strategy you know, is going to have some some trouble because uh, it looks like that's going to start from moral intuitions, and uh, those intuitions are obviously based on what our basic evaluative attitudes are. But again, you know, with with that, that that requires like a pretty substantive account of what that methodology is, and I I don't think it's going to be the case. So like. It, even if even if it were the case that that particular methodology was undermined, it looks like there's going to be other methodologies that uh, realists and anti-realists, for that matter, can use to form moral beliefs. So, yeah, yeah. I, one one thing that we haven't yet mentioned is this, with regard specifically to the evolutionary debunking arguments. There are other debunking arguments, as as we know, but evolutionary pressures tend to operate more or less uniformly across a species. If you, those natural selective pressures were the sole or the primary causal influence on the content of our evaluative attitudes, then we should expect to see a huge amount of agreement <laughs> across the species. We don't, of course, and, and, and the pervasiveness of moral disagreement is often utilized as a premise in an anti-realist argument, of course. But this debunker can't really, can't have it both ways. On the one hand, once we attend to the way that natural selective pressures actually work, we would expect a kind of attitudinal uniformity in the species that we see, we see some, you know, across species, uh, uh, sorry, across cultures, we see um, a pro-attitude taken towards uh, protecting one's kin, for instance, but we see so much in the way of disagreement, evolution can't account for that, given the way that evolution operates. And so we ought to think that there's a, there's something else. If you're an anti-realist, you can think that something else is primarily, you know, culture, and then we can we can uh, jig up the objection once more. But if we focus just at least on the evolutionary element of it there's going to be that sort of problem. The problem is disagreement, we call it. Yeah, I think uh, on that point about, you know, uh, as you say, jigging up the objection again with respect to culture, of course you can run a, uh, a sort of genealogical debunking argument that uses, a, you know, that says, well, you know, our moral beliefs are explained by a culture or something like that. But then it seems to me like, the, the, I mean, the, the obvious response to that is going to be, well, you know, look, our like our culture, you know, what, one of the things that we've done in our culture is we've developed all of these methods for developing reliable moral beliefs or for, you know, removing biases or, or like whatever. So, I mean, once you accept that moral beliefs are, you know, even if you say, okay, moral beliefs are produced by culture, um, as it, it seems like you can then say, well, we have the right sort of cultural institutions for, um, you know, producing uh, uh, accurate moral beliefs or something along those lines. I mean, I, I guess I, I, I feel like I, I, I kind of want to say, you know, this about pretty much all of my beliefs. Um, you know, it, it seems like I can give a, a story about the formation of my beliefs concerning, you know, the age of the earth, um, which is going to involve, I mean, that's, that's like highly kind of culturally dependent. It required a very, very, very specific kind of culture to, uh, you know, like we had to produce, you know, to produce the kind of scientific instruments that we have and to produce the sort of theoretical sophistication um, and understanding of things like, you know, radiation and so on that allows us to make inferences about the origin of the earth. So, um, I mean, it looks like a cultural debunking argument is sort of right off the bat going to have some, some problems. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's nice. It's, a, it's also going to have an iteration of the disagreement problem because, as we know, cultures are not homogeneous with regard to the evaluative attitudes held by all of those within the culture. So if it were just the culture plus evolution that's crank, that's, that's fully causally responsible for the content of your evaluative attitudes or, or judgments, then we should expect uniformity 
of those attitudes and judgments within the culture. And that's not what we see. Yeah. That's complementary to what you said. Is it the case that uh, we form beliefs because these things are true or is it? Um... I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> let, let, let's put it this way. If, if we don't, then it seems that um, I mean, there are complications here, yeah. but in a great many cases, at least, then it would just seem an accident that yeah. if we've got a true belief at all, it's that, that we have a true belief at all. Right. Yeah. And that, and that point holds not just in moral epistemology, but in epistemology, in epistemology generally. Mm -hmm. So th this, uh, this explanatory, let's call it this explanatory constraint on justification, which is that, uh, uh, let's just talk about beliefs as they're relevant attitudes. A belief is uh, epistemically justified only if uh, it's explained in some way by uh, the, uh, the truth of its contents, let's say, by the fact that the belief is uh, intended to represent. Um, that, you know, it used to be that this explanatory constraint was construed causally you know, uh, as Benassarif did and Goldman used to do, that's no longer thought, that's not plausible, really. You can't account for justification of beliefs about the future, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, so if it's, if there's no, if it's the case that we come to our moral judgments, if the explanation of why we uh, have the moral judgments we do has nothing to do with the truth of those judgments, that's bad. Uh, so I'm hoping that <laughs> there is this explanatory connection there after all. I guess that 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 probably uh, is good for the evolutionary bunking argument. And maybe uh, before we wrap up, you know, maybe we've got like 13, 14 more minutes or so. Um, and we could probably talk about one more uh, kind of argument, whether it's anti-realist or realist in nature. So, um, yeah, I mean, maybe, um, maybe, maybe one actually, um, because I think this is really where the, the crux of the, dis the, the, well, at least the main disagreement would be between us two, um, is that, you know, I think that the reason, the problem I have with a lot of forms of realism is that I, I just, I, I'm not really sure what it, what it means to say that, you know, I would have, say, a desire independent reason for action, or, you know, I, or like there are categorical reasons for action, or, anything along those lines, you know? So um, when I, I, I don't really have like a, a, a theory of reasons, um, but <laughs> when I think about the sort of context in which I would make claims about reasons or about, you know, what I ought to do, if I think about, okay, how would I communicate the meaning of that? Like, let's say I'm, you know, I, I look outside, you know, I see it's raining outside and I, I, I say, oh, I, I have reason to put on a coat or like I ought to get a coat. Um, it seems to me like, okay, well, um, what that amounts to is, you know, I have a desire to stay dry. Um, putting on a coat would be a means to staying dry and putting on a coat isn't going to frustrate any of my other desires. And, you know, it's like, if I was, if I, if I was sitting with somebody who's not an English speaker and they were like, what do you mean when you say you ought to put on a coat or you have reason to put on a coat? That's how I would explain the meaning. Um, and I mean, I, I I, I think that <laughs> I think it's it just comes down to like I really don't know what these categorical reasons or external normative reasons even are, and I mean maybe that's just like a problem with me. Maybe it's just I have some I don't know conceptual deficiency or something which is preventing me from uh, from understanding this. Um, but you know, I, I like that. Ultimately, I think is is why I end up uh, rejecting a lot of forms of realism, or at least why I'm attracted to to anti realism. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Maybe maybe you could help yeah. elucidate. But yeah. <laughs> no, maybe yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so let me say a couple preliminary things. And one is that you're in good company. Uh, mm -hmm. That you know the the strongest anti realist arguments that I'm aware of take the form of take one or another form of your worry, Kane, about categoricity. No, here's, an here's the other preliminary, preliminary thing, and that is that this worry, let's call it the categoricity worry uh, about, about uh, moral realism, uh, presupposes that this thesis called authority is an element of moral realism. Because as 
for this minimalist uh, characterization, Joe, that you gave early on, there's no commitment to categoricity among uh, it, within realism. And so if you're puzzled as Kane is about how there could be such a thing as a categorical reason, that needn't bar your warm embrace of moral realism. And if you think about certain folks who count as paradigm moral realists, though they're naturalists, people like Peter Railton or Dick Boyd, um, these, uh, these folks reject uh, Nick Sturgeon. As far as I, I, I know, these folks do or have, when they were writing, rejected categorical reasons. And so what I take it, Kane, you're really worried about is of you like my kind, you know, the non-naturalist kind who, or the maximalist I, kind. I have other objections to, sorry. Yeah, I, okay, yeah, I know there's, there's but, lots of objections, of course. Um, but, yeah, uh, so yeah. To, to naturalists, I would say something different, but um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, I think that, look, look, I could ask this question. Do you understand what it is for a fact to favor an action? Um, I don't. I don't think so. Um, again, okay. or, or rather, let me put it this way: like, I mean, I, I can, I think, make sense of that. But again, I would probably end up making sense of it in terms of sort of desires and you know means end reasoning and, and things like that. You know, and so uh, like, yeah, I when when I think about like, okay, you know, I have a reason to put on the coat. Um, I can maybe understand that in terms of like some fact in the world is favoring a particular action on my part, but that favoring relationship, if you were to ask me to explain it, I think I would just explain it in the sort of same terms. Um, so, yeah, so yeah. I, I, yeah, so I want you not to explain it in the same, well, you might explain it in the same terms, but you had said you don't really know what it means. So that, that's why I asked the question as I did. I, I, I think that you probably do understand when I say the fact that it's raining outside favors your grabbing your raincoat or your umbrella. I think you understand what I say when I say such a thing, when other people say such a thing. And then, then the question is, why does that fact favor grabbing your umbrella? And then the story you want to tell Cain comes in. It's because you want to stay dry. And that desire and the fact that in taking this action, your desire would be promoted together, explain why it is that this fact, namely it's raining outside, favors, that is, counts as the reason for picking up your umbrella and walking outside with it. The disagreement, I take it, that between uh, you and me is not in whether there is such a thing as the favoring relation or how to understand or the very meaning of the term favoring, but rather it's a disagreement. Here's my surmise. The, the disagreement is whether or not, uh, in, let's put it this way, instrumental reasons are the only reasons there are, where an instrumental reason is a reason that is, that is a fact whose favoring status, is, whose status as a reason is fully grounded in a further fact, namely that in acting in the way the reason favors, you're gonna promote your desire. I believe there are such reasons, let's call these instrumental reasons, but I also believe there are non-instrumental reasons. And I, I take it that's the real locus of our disagreement. And here's how I would try, here's an argument I try to convince you. <laughs> I've tried on others, has, you know, it hasn't always worked, but here's the argument that has convinced me. And that's the following. If you're blameworthy for a given action, then there's a reason not to do it. And some people are blameworthy for actions, even though they've got no desires that would be satisfied or promoted by refraining from those actions. And therefore those people have reason to refrain from those actions. So if you take, so the first premise, if you're blameworthy, then you've got a reason. I think that's a conceptual truth myself. If there's no reason at all for you to refrain from doing your action, you can't, there's no basis for criticism, as far as I can tell. There's certainly no basis for the very strong sort of criticism that is blameworthiness. So I think that premise is secure, but of course we could talk about that. 
And then I think you'll imagine someone who just is a, a moral monster and n- none of whose desires will be satisfied by towing the moral line. It seems to me that when that person acts as he so wants to act, he's blameworthy. Let's imagine that, you know, some, something, t- just something terrible, you know, he, he likes preying on kids uh, and, and he does so. That strikes me as blameworthy. Um, by the first premise, that entails that he's got some reason. But by hypothesis, given the way I've just in a thumbnail sketch characterizes moral psychology, that reason doesn't come from, it's not grounded in, that is, in uh, the fact that acting in the way that he's doing is going to promote his desire. Because after all, the reason is a reason against his preying on children. It follows, if, if you accept both of those claims, it, it follows that this guy, this moral monster, there's a reason for him to refrain from his actions, even though that reason is not instrumental to, to securing or promoting any of his desires. Yeah, so I think, um, first of all, I, I should say, um, just as like a, just to clarify, because I mean, one of the things you, you're saying is, you know, okay, like the, the instrumental reasons are, in, are reasons that are grounded in our desires. And I'm not actually sure that I, I even accept reasons in that sense. Um, I like, I, 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 I'm not, I'm, I'm re- I don't, I don't know. So like when I was talking about, um, you know, explaining reasons, I just mean, I'm just, I, all I'm doing there is just imagining like explaining what I mean when I'm using the term. And I mean, obviously other people may mean different things, um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't endorse any particular sort of theory of reasons. At least I don't think so. Um, but with respect to the, um, the argument that you mentioned there, um, yeah, I, I think, the, so like, I, I, would, I would say, for instance, you know, this person has a reason not to do this. But um, I would see that as expressing something about like my values and my desires, you know. So, uh, I, I mean, again, I, 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 I'm not sort of, I, I, I'm not seeing where the kind of categoricity comes in. Um, What's the ground, if, if I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just so I understand your, your reply, what is the full ground of that reason? to refrain from preying on children? When I say that um, he has a reason to refrain from preying on, preying on children, um, well, I, you know, it obviously depends on, uh, on, <laughs> on what I'm saying. So, I mean, I could obviously make some sort of prudential argument, I could appeal to the fact that it's illegal and that he has an interest in, you know, not being arrested, et cetera. But like putting that aside, um, as, assuming that, you know, we're ignoring that kind of prudential argument, um, it's, I think it just comes down to, you know, look, I, I don't want to live in a world in which people prey on children. Um, that, that horrifies me and, um, like that's it. Uh, now from this guy's point of view, you can say, well, like what, you know, what reason does he have to listen to you? And I mean, from his point of view, none whatsoever. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But is, so are you saying that are you taking a kind of expressivist view about reason talk here? That you're you're not saying something that's literally correct. That this guy has a reason, or there is a reason for him to refrain from preying on kids. What you're doing is rather expressing your negative attitude towards what he's doing. Is is that your take on this? Because that's not what I heard initially. I heard that what you were saying is something truth and valuable, and then I was just wondering, well, what is the ground of your re- of of this guy's reason? By hypothesis, it's nothing to do with desire satisfaction because his desires would only be thwarted were he to refrain from preying on kids. So what is the ground? The ground isn't that isn't any attitude of yours, presumably. That's not a reason for him to refrain from doing something. But I didn't hear anything else that might serve as the full ground. That's why I thought maybe you're, you're an expressivist about um, reasons locutions. I mean, I, m- maybe I, I actually think you know. It, I, I'm not sure I would even talk about reasons in that case. Um, like that, it, it, that seems like a fairly unnatural way of speaking uh, to me. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I can I can imagine saying like, "Hey, you have a reason not to do that," but um, 
like that's I think that just comes from you know look I adopt a certain set of values there are you know things that I care about and um you know when I, when I say he has a reason not to do it I'm yeah I'm, I'm just communicating I'm just communicating those commitments and I, I suppose you could give that an expressivist analysis uh if you want <laughs> So it sounds like you're saying that um, <clears throat> he doesn't have a reason, um, but <clears throat> by his lights, he doesn't have a reason or something yeah. like that. But yeah. um, you can still say like, no, don't, you shouldn't do that or something like that because you're kind of just, a, you're making a, a kind of a normative claim. And from your meta-ethical perspective, that normative claim isn't made true by some something stance independent. It's um, maybe it's made true by... Uh, your desires or something like that is that is that is that right yeah I uh, so like I mean I'm I'm still going to go around you know uh, making moral judgments and uh, express it's a very uh, you know useful tool for uh, for expressing one's values um, or for reporting one's values uh, or whatever um, so you know I I still make those judgments um, and I I do, I do, I think sometimes talk about reasons, but I, I'm not like, I'm actually not sure if I even believe, like, do I believe that like there are reasons? I mean, I, I'm not sure about that. So I, you know, I mean, it's, it's um, maybe like if I'm sitting down and, you know, I'm, I'm watching a movie or something and I'm like, oh, this film is a drag. And then somebody says, right, well, <laughs> you know, what exactly is a drag, right? There are drags. And what is your theory of drags? I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say to that, you know. Uh, um, maybe that's not a good analogy, but <laughs> maybe that expresses something of uh, of my my issue here. Um, yeah, and be before I turn it over to Russ, um, I just wanted to quickly note um, for the audience that uh, I, I said earlier, like, made true by, but, you know, we could, of course, understand this, like, uh, even if we were to suppose that... Uh, given his sympathies, Kane is, is an error theorist, like we could, we could, error theorists could still be fictionalists, say, and so I, I could still use that as a kind of fictional discourse. So I wasn't trying to impute to Kane earlier that he's an individualist subjectivist. Okay, so just for the audience, um, and then I'll turn it over to Russ. Yeah, I'm, I still, I'm not sure which, so I've given an argument with two premises, and I'm mm. not sure which premise you reject, Kane, because uh, I think it's a valid argument. So if it's the case that blameworthiness, you know, blameworthiness entails a reason against the action for which you're blameworthy, and this moral monster is blameworthy, therefore there's a reason against doing what he does. And by hypothesis, that reason has not does not have a full ground in his desires or any of his contingent commitments. And that's a categorical reason. It's just a reason that's not fully grounded in uh, people's contingent commitments it's a little more complicated than that but yeah, uh, yeah. okay yeah I, I so I, I think I would uh, reject the first one and um okay I mean I, I yeah possibly the second as well I uh, I I mean the thing is is that like um you know like I might accept the second one uh you know just because I mean, so maybe I, I I didn't say this earlier. I said I'm not really an error theorist. I should say one of the reasons why I'm not an error theorist is because I think truth can come very cheaply. Um, and I think that even if it's the case that, you know, moral judgments involve some sort of uh, commitment to, uh, to, to an error, um, it might still be the case that some of these judgments are true, um, kind of in the same way as like uh, colour language, arguably, you know, when we use colour claims that involves attributing intrinsic uh, color properties like to, to the surfaces of objects and maybe there are no such properties but maybe we still want to say it's true to say that grass is green um so uh, you know a claim like you know the moral monster is blameworthy I'm, I'm not sure it depends on your theory of truth i might reject that one as well um okay but so, i think i think it now we know where we one. stand <laughs> 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 well, all right. Yeah, I mean, so I, I know we could go back and forth uh, endlessly on this, of course, but um, we're probably going to come to a close here. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I really enjoyed this. So thank you guys both for coming on. Do we have any final words or anything that you guys wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to say? I'll uh, start with Russ and then and then Kane, and then I'll do my little closing. No, I, I uh, did the bulk of the talking here. I said all I wanted to say, and thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk to you both.
Thanks. All right. Well, uh, yeah, thank you guys both for coming on. You can st stick around just a little bit after this. This is just my outro for the audience. So um, everyone, if you enjoy the work that I do, please consider supporting me on Patreon or a one-time donation. I'm a lowly college student, so any help works. And uh, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason and peace out. Thank you.